What's going on guys, it's Uncle Nick here, and as promised, I'm following up on that Q&A. You guys delivered with a bunch of Q&A questions. I noticed that I did get a better turnout with that, mentioning it in the beginning of the video versus the end. So that's probably what I'm going to do from now on when I want to do a Q&A again with you guys. I would like to do them a little more often because it seems like you guys have a lot of questions, which is good. I like answering questions for you guys the best that I can because I'm not always able to do that. Some of my videos, maybe someone requests or asks a question and I do a video on that, but then I'm really only reaching out to one person, but maybe also other people have that same question. So, but this way I know exactly what's on your guys' mind. So it gives me kind of a little bit of insight exactly where your heads are at. Let's get to answer some questions. All right, so the first question I have here is from N.D. Bartel. He asked, Advice for what to do with your mouth when bracing. Does that have something to do with Brian Shaw, with why Brian Shaw uses a mouth guard? So, I never really thought about it. I just kind of puff my cheeks out, I think. That, that's pretty much what I do. But the mouth guard isn't really for air. The mouth guard is for alignment and so you don't crack a molar clenching down too hard because some people do clench. You have a lot of bite power in your jaw. So if you clench too hard, you could crack a tooth. Something grinding your teeth will wear them down. So that is mainly for the alignment of your jaw, which translates to your spine. And so you don't crack teeth. Thanks for the question, man. Hick Life asks, what are the different weights of kegs that are used? I want to do some carries and presses, but I don't want to kill myself or underdo it. Edit. Also, how do you feel about doing some videos about your time in the service. I was a CB and mostly just curious about what you did while you were in. If not, it's okay, I fully understand. Not everyone's to talk about their time. Thanks for the question, man. So the different weights of kegs are used depend on what weight class you compete at. Now, at the level I compete at, it's typically anywhere from 225 to 300 pounds, depending on what you're doing. At most carry medleys I've seen are 225 to 50, 275 as a 198 or 200 pounder. Even in the middleweight 231s, it's, our weights are usually similar, if not the same. Heavyweights, they get 300, upper 200s to 300 pounds plus. So depending on your weight, it's going to vary. That's, uh, that's kind of hard to answer because they vary from competition to competition. I would say mid to two 200s. Uh, I don't know where your strength level's at. So if you're not there yet, try to get there. Train, work your way up, just like you would on any other lift. Also, I do plan on doing a video eventually on my service stuff. Uh, I've mentioned it before. I have a lot of pictures and videos stashed away on a computer, but that computer does not work right, so I'm having a lot of trouble getting them off of there. I have to take it to someone who knows a lot more about computers than I do, which is probably literally anyone. But with that being said, I, I will be doing that eventually because you're not the first person to ask that. You probably won't be the last, but uh, to answer your question, basically on that, I was in the Army. I was a door gunner on UH-60 Blackhawks with 10th Mountain Division, that flag right there. Next question, Allen's Active Productions asks, if you had to re-enlist in the Army, one, would you do it? Two, what job would you choose instead of your previous and why? So if I had to re-enlist in the Army, would you do it? If I had to, then I guess I wouldn't really have a choice. I'm, I'm not against it if I, wherever life takes me, if that's an option, I'm not against it. What job would I choose instead of your previous? So like I just mentioned, I was a door gun on UH-60 Blackhawks. I'm actually, I actually completed my civilian private pilot's license for Hilo, so I would probably go the warrant officer route. I wouldn't actually enlist. I would go fly instead of being a crew chief or a door gunner. That appeals to me the most, uh, especially being a warrant officer. I mean, they're never around, so can't go wrong there. The next question. The Shortish Nord, he asks, how do I find out what the optimal size and weight is for my frame? In order to compete, I, I have to meet weight in obviously, but do I know which weight class to aim for? I'm only 5'5", five five, I'm currently 195. So you'd compete at 200 pounds or 198. I would not recommend bulking like you asked because you do not want your weight to exceed your strength limit because as you get heavier in weight, the weights get heavier in competition. So if anything, if it's bad weight, I would try and lose drop weight, maybe get to 175s. I don't know your body composition. So to tell you to gain or lose is really out of context for me because I do not know where you sit in that. But I mean, if you're at two, if you're 195 pounds, you're making weight for 200 to 198s all day long. So 
maybe try and compete there. Oh boy, I'm gonna mess this one up. Host Tizio McFinasto. Sorry. Training seven days a week. What would be reasonable number of times to train a carry event each week? A, if you're strength training seven days a week, I would not be recommending that to begin with because your CNS is going to get fried, especially at the weights and percentages that I lift. I cannot train seven days a week. It would not work. I would be destroyed. I wouldn't be getting anything out of it. I, and I'd get hurt, mainly. So what would be the reasonable number of times to train a carry event each week? Once, twice? I mean, are you good at it? Are you bad at it? I mean, if you're bad at it, train it a little bit more. Maybe drop the weight, up the frequency. Uh, I mean, there's so many different carry events, man. So you could literally train a different carry event each day of the week, twice, because it's strongman. We carry everything. That's half the battle. As far as giving you a real specific answer on that, I kind of can't. So I apologize in advance, and I hope that gave you some insight on what you were looking for. XW, yeah, that's, that's a pretty, see, this guy gets it. Straight forward to the point, two letters, that's his name. Too easy. Thanks, guy. Do you have any current plans on moving up in weight class? Even if you don't completely fill it out, would you ever compete just past the threshold of the 200 pound to make the competition harder slash prepare for competing with 231s at the Arnold? I'm not worried about my weight. I'm worried about my strength. So if I get to the point where I'm strong enough to really do more damage in the 231s, then the weight will come as I go. So I'm not focusing on the, I'm not gonna bulk up to make weight. I'm gonna get strong enough so I can do the events. Now I was strong enough at the Arnold. I had no issue with the competition weight there. So my weight wasn't really a hindrance. My, my finishing position came down to me falling on my face with the farmers, but uh, I, I wouldn't be really so much worried about weight as I would be about strength. Tony Sudo asks, what's your next comp? It's official strongman games in December 7th, 8th, and 9th in Raleigh, North Carolina. Patty Finn, what, if any, strength work do you do in your final month whilst mainly focusing on events? Cheers. Cheers to you, mate. You've got to be like British or Australian to say cheers. That's why I threw the mate in there. Seemed fitting. So the strength work that I do, I will still hit the main lifts. I, I won't neglect any of that, but... That is basically more of a warm up for the uh, events because I'm in my last week right now. So for this last, especially the last two weeks, I am doing just events. Like I did squats to warm up for my throws, but that's it. So I, I won't neglect, I might do some assistance, kind of finish myself off, but I want to keep stuff in the tank and not overdo it with the assistance type stuff and the strength type stuff that might cut into my event training. So I won't really focus on that as long as I get the event training done and maybe even get uh, on, a, on an event day where I can do a throw and a press medley or something, get both of those in at the same day, kill two birds in one stone, because the throw isn't super taxing. Real deal. The real deal. Q&A question. What will your nutrition look like on the day of the competition? What things do you eat before and between events? Basically, my nutrition is not gonna change. I've been on the vertical diet for a few months now, and I like my weights maintaining pretty steady. My strength is keeping up with my work output. So I'm happy with what that is giving me right now. So I'm gonna make sure I'm still on schedule with my meals, even on game day. With that being said, I'm not always the hungriest in between events because I, I guess it's the nerves or something. I don't know. But I will, I almost always bring peanut butter and jelly. Uh, protein bars, just so I get something. I definitely bring Sour Patch Kids, eat a handful of those right after event. So I have some quick sugar to get in me right after the event, but it's mainly gonna be the, the beef, rice, orange juice, that type of stuff that I'm normally eating anyway. Harris Matsukas, Q&A question. How do you build explosiveness? Well, by moving as fast as you can in any given direction, changing direction, lighter weight, moving fast, just focus on moving fast. Quick inputs to power, going zero to 100 as fast as you can. That's the best to train. To tr build explosiveness, you have to train explosively. So that might mean dropping weight for a while and really focusing on being able to go from zero to full tilt as hard as fast as you can in that shortest amount of time. Raging Reagan, Regan, one of the two. Q 
Q&A question. Do you gym member, you guys included, ever hang out together when not at the gym? And if so, what are some of the things you guys do? Uh, well, we spend most of our time at the gym. Uh, we don't really have the opportunity to go out and have a beer together. None of us really even drink, mainly for time reasons. But when we do get to hang out, it's mainly like YouTube collaborations or we're traveling together. That's pretty much our hangout time or if we're doing a stupid YouTube video that's outside of the gym. Uh, we try to get together every once in a blue moon, set aside some time. But we're, we're here so often that our hangout time is spent here. Brian Miljevic. Yeah. Hey Nick, I'm looking to buy some more strongman equipment. Any advice on who to go through for log and circus dumbbell? Right now I have an axle, farmer's handles, a couple of big tires, and stones. For the log, I would go through Pitbull Strongman on Facebook. We have a Pitbull log here. It is the best bang for buck as far as durability and price because when you're talking logs, your main focus is durability. It was about 300 and some high 300s. Uh, with shipping, I believe. He's located here in the States, I'm not sure where, but you go to Pitbull Strongman Equipment on Facebook and you contact him directly through there via Messenger. So that is who I would recommend for that. Dumbbells, one of the better ones I've seen is Texas Power Concepts. They make custom dumbbells, painted or whatever color you want. I've heard nothing but good things about them. We actually don't have one. I don't know where we actually got ours. So, I mean, we have a Slater dumbbell, but that's one where you have to load like lead shot and stuff into. But Texas Power Concepts is one of the main ones I see all the time and hear nothing but good things about. So check those two out, man. Dennis Svensson, what's your favorite conditioning or least hated, and what kind do you do up to the up to events? Least hated. What is my least hated? I don't know. I feel like if you hate it the least, that means it's probably not the best. Some of the best conditioning I've ever done was loaded the yoke to about 60% and then you go as far as you can in 10 minutes. And then you take five minutes rest and then you try and beat your time back or you beat your number of laps. So that is brutal, destroys your back, destroys your legs. That is, that is something that allows you to really get in your head and kind of find out who you are. So I would definitely recommend trying that. What kind of I do leading up to events? I basically would do like EMOMs every minute on the minute with something that's related to the events that I have in the competition. Uh, I'll create medleys, do the medleys at like 50%, run them as fast as I can. So it's not really about the weight, it's about moving fast, getting the rounds in, getting the reps in, and working on that conditioning. Half past time asks, I was too late last time. How's your training slash programming train since meeting Brian Shaw? Well, I did a little revamp on my deadlift. I was working on that and kind of rebuilding that with building my deadlift up without the hitch, doing a lot of band stuff, working on lockout, showing a little more control. But my programming hasn't really changed. I'm still getting good results out of the programming that I do use. So I'm not gonna fix them that's not broke. When I stop seeing results with the way that I run my program, then I'll change things up. Outside of really revamping my deadlift and tweaking that, that that's really about it. James Short asks, how old were you when you very first started training and how strong were your lifts? I think the first time I really messed with a barbell was high school. I, I kind of knew I was strong because I grew up doing farm stuff, working for my dad's paving company, so I was always around heavy equipment and picking up heavy manual labor type stuff. So I think one of the very first times I deadlifted, I walked up to like, I not knowing anything about what I was doing, I picked up 275, somewhere between 275 and, and 300 maybe. But really, I wasn't really training then. Training, I think, when I first started training, training my deadlift was around 400 pounds. That's without any knowledge of real, real technique, that type of stuff. I've always done more of conditioning side of things, playing lacrosse and ice hockey and a little bit of fighting. Everything was more conditioning related, so it was more about reps than actual raw weight. Brian Clifford asks, have you considered doing USS Nationals? Yes. He, and he also says the winner of the 198 class qualifies for Strongman Champions League 90kg World Championship. Yes, I have considered it. I was looking at the events for the next years coming up. It looks like a good event lineup. I, yes, I am considering it. I don't want to do NAS again. Uh, I won that one. I can get my, and the only incentive for winning that one is an Arnold qualifier, and I can get that in my own backyard here in Maryland now with a Platinum Plus show, so 
why spend the extra money and go out there to nationals some show that i've i've already won yeah i could defend my title but i would rather go for a bigger fish than completely catch the same fish over and over again so yes i would like to do uss nationals i do have an interest in that tim good I get inner elbow pains from working my grips slash forearm flexors during deads, farmers, all types of pulling. Do you get aches from gripping a lot? Do you do anything? I really don't get any aches, but I actually did a grip video with Dirty Andy. I don't know where he went. And he talked about working the extensors, so the opposite of clinching, but extending. But he said that is a big factor in helping alleviate that pain you get from constantly squeezing. Nathan J asks, do you train circus dumbbell on both sides? Yes and no. Yes, when I'm warming up, after about 50-60%, I do not because when I'm competing, I use one arm. The, usually the follow-up question asks, well, doesn't that arm get tired? No, your legs actually will tire out before, the, sorry, before your shoulder actually does because you're using a lot of leg drive. And the switch hands takes a lot more time when I can just touch and go with that same hand, get more reps in. So why would I train the other arm when I'm gonna, just going to train it when I'm doing log, uh, other two-handed implements. People talk about imbalances, but I haven't noticed any, zero, no imbalances by training my competition arm over my off arm because you train circus dumbbell, but you're also training other implements when you're pressing. You don't do one-handed log clean and press. You don't do one-handed normal dumbbell presses, whatever it may be. I, every other press variation requires two hands. So. I'm getting more training in with both than I am without it. So I haven't noticed any imbalance whatsoever. Anonymous shit poster. Seems legit. What exercise should I do for the thick luscious beard? That's about a question I would expect from someone with the name anonymous shit poster. I like it. What exercise should I do for a thick luscious beard? Hmm. So you should start with go finding the biggest tree you can find, chopping it down, bare hands, Chuck Norris style. Then you're gonna go find the biggest, baddest bear in the area. If you don't have any bears in your area, well, guess it looks like you're traveling. You're gonna walk up to a punch it right in the face. Then immediately after, this part's important, immediately after, you drink Cobra's blood. Down the hatch, will it one time. K, single syllable. Wasn't that the guy's name from Men in Black, Agent K? I'm pretty sure it was. What exercise was unexpectedly a real game changer in your training, meaning exercise you've never done before, but once you started doing it, helped you progress tremendously? Easy, Z-Press. I did not do Z-Presses till I started coming here, and when I learned about those, I was doing about the wazoo, and they did wonders for my overhead press. Like, it was a complete game changer, so Z-Presses, hands down, was the biggest thing that changed the game for my overhead press or any exercise for that matter. It just, it was like a light bulb went off. Ulrika Trig, probably butchered that one too. So, sorry. I'm buying some home gym equipment, but I haven't much space. Since I'm rather small myself, I thought of starting with a stubby axle bar and some jerk blocks. A, I don't know what a stubby axle bar is. Two, uh, jerk blocks. Um. I don't know why that would, a stubby axle bar and jerk blocks would be your go-to. I mean, I don't know what equipment you already have. Maybe a rack? Just a normal axle. I, I, I don't know enough about what your situation is space-wise to really recommend, but I, I've, I don't know what a stubby axle bar is. I'd have to go home and Google that, but I try to answer these questions completely unprepared so you get my honest upfront answer, not something thought out. So with that being said, I would just get a normal axle bar, really. An SSB bar if you don't have one. That is a huge, that's, I pretty much only squat with that. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Maybe some sandbags, kegs, things of that nature. Kegs are easy to get. Go to your local bar, frat house, and most of the time if you just pay the down payment on the keg, they'll give, the, give you that. So, farmer's handles. Yeah, I have no clue what a stubby axle bar is. Joe Miller, what's up, Joe? How much of your training is event related in the last four weeks? Do you practice them each workout once a week? Did you deadlift and squat or literally just event work? Curious about the specifics. Great question. How I break that down is basically within that last four weeks is really when up until the last four weeks, I'm training at least one event a week in some shape or form, whether it's for conditioning. I'm getting used to the movement 
beforehand. The last four weeks, I kind of upped the weight closer to comp weight, start getting familiar with that, the heavier side of things. And then once I get into that last three weeks, because four weeks, when you hit that four week mark, you only have three weeks left of training before, before you deload. At least that's how I do it. Because I like that whole week of deload. It really gives me the most amount of rest and I feel a lot fresher coming into the competition. I'm gonna get a little bit specific here. That first week within the last month, I'm doing my primary strength stuff beforehand then I'm going in training events. Then the last two weeks, I am training events and events only for the most part because when you train a comp weight, it takes, it takes it out of you. I might warm up with a primary strength movement, but that is about it. Like I mentioned earlier, to do throws, I did squats to warm up my legs. So that's really about, it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. Those last real two weeks are events and events only because that fourth week I'm deloading. And if my weight is a little bit too heavy, I may do some conditioning to manage that weight, but nothing crazy that will tax me. So that, that's really about it. I, I think I answered a question similar to this earlier, but that is about all I got for you guys. That was the last question, I believe. You guys had a lot of questions. It took me a hot minute to get through all this stuff, but it was good. I like, it, it gives, it gets my brain going. So I really appreciate you guys. I hope I answered all the questions. It was a lot of questions to get through in a reasonable amount of time. So this Q and A might be a little longer than the last one. I'm super happy the turnout you guys came out with for the for this Q and A. And like I like I mentioned earlier, I try. I don't go and look at these beforehand. I know when I'm going to answer the Q and A. I look at the number of comments engage when I kinda am gonna do that so I know there's some substance. The only thing I looked at was the number of comments I had, but up until opening and turning on this camera, that's I, I was reading the questions for the first time pretty much as I went. You guys are getting uh, pretty much the raw answer without Googling or, or looking up stuff, looking up answers. You guys are getting off the top of the dome piece, no rehearsal. So you guys know you're getting my 100% honest answer, straightforward as best as I can for you guys. But that is pretty much about all I got for you guys. We are wrapping up this Q&A video. Thank you so much for everyone who asked a question. Thank you guys so much for watching. But until the next time, you guys know what the deal is. Get out there, get after it, and embrace the suck.